mangrove to a metropolis has been the man-made story of Singapore. Our farmers and fishermen are an essential element in our economy, supplying fresh greens the whole year round. This video was made over 50 years ago. It opened my eyes to how important farming used to be back then. Today, we wouldn't survive long eating food only grown in Singapore. Be it meat, produce or seafood, we ship more than 90% of our food from all over the globe. Which is why even something small, thousands of miles away, can have a huge impact on how much we pay for our food. Enjoy it more because the prices might go up. Oh man. Fifty dollars cannot buy as much as seven years ago. This season, I'm going far. Sorry, sorry. And getting dirty. <laughs> to find the real story behind the question. So why is our food more expensive? Ow, ow. My name is Ming. I'm a self-taught chef. Guys, all day uh, should have three roast chicken on standby, right? Restaurant owner. Dip each little oyster into the pasteurized egg yolk. And a massive food nerd. And I'm on a mission to find out what we're really paying for. In this episode, I'm in pursuit of a very special fish. Because yellowtail fish is the best raw material to get the traditional fish bowl texture. They're stealing fish. Do we have to say goodbye to cheap seafood forever? I will get two bowls of fishball noodles and then I'll get a bowl of soup also with fish balls inside. Yeah. That's skinny and ballsy. As a chef, supper is my favourite meal of the day. We don't have much time to eat and unwind while we're running our restaurants. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 And this is one of our favourite places Yankee Eating House. How about the idea that I'm going to actually bounce it around and it's good to bounce? Do that. Aye, and I'm going to see how high it bounces. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So to me, if it doesn't bounce, it's not a good fish ball. You guys think fish balls are part of supper culture, things that we eat at night? I think every time we go out, we've got fish balls somewhere. Like, whether it's soup or noodles or whatever. It's an oldie thing, isn't it? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, supper, three well, stuff. Another maybe. aspect of their popularity is because it's relatively easy to, to, to serve out, right? I always and I finish my fish balls before my noodles. There's never enough fish ball, you know? I have half a mind of getting enough bowl, honestly speaking. So I didn't really have a habit of eating fish balls as a kid. Now fish balls for me are a supper food, right? I have them in fishball noodles late at night. Uh, I've got a couple of friends here who think differently though. Hello. Xander, can you tell me why you like fish balls so much? They aren't really like fish because they don't have that many bones and uh, bite size for me. So what's your favourite kind of fish ball? It's the kind that's really, really bouncy and there's a lot of flavour. And when I eat it, it's like very soft, chewy, chewy. How many times a week do you eat fish balls? It's like 10 times. 10 uh, times? Usually once or twice a week. Would you eat them every day if you could? Mm, yeah. Fried boiled or steamed. 
Singaporeans eat over a million fish balls every day. We love our fish balls. Which is probably why a hawker has made the news. When he raised the price of his fish ball noodles by 50 cents. Today, I'm meeting the man behind the fish ball noodle controversy. Grab the paste. Yep. You roll it and drop back in. But even before I can ask the hard questions, he wants me to learn how to make fish balls. <laughs> not, not easy. This is hard. The proper way. Better? Too big, this one. Too big. Yeah, this 30 cent also cannot cover. <laughs> this is turning out a lot harder than I expected. What you're doing now is you're scooping the, the fish ball out of your hand. <laughs> Try pressing it. Press together it. into the mold so that it becomes round ah, and see. smooth at the side. Yes. But you see, that, 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 that one cannot. Uh, got big hole. <laughs> that was giving me a hard time with this. Uh. Douglas Ng opened his fishball noodle store in 2014. So it's 100% yellowtail. He didn't survive long selling his noodles for only $3 because his operational costs were too high. I didn't know how to make a business out of it. And then I put a cost into consideration. I decided to increase the price. And then my business went uh, a bit affected. Uh, there was a drop of close to maybe 30 to 40 percent. Wow, that's quite a lot, huh? Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. So the ingredients in your fish balls, right? We've been making using this paste. What's inside? Other than salt that help to bind it, water, all the fish is actually just pure yellowtail fish. Because you're talking about pure yellowtail fish, about $11 a kilo. And then there's a lot of fishes that are maybe $6, $5 per kilo. So naturally, people will shortcuts and try to have a better margin, I would rather not do it, you see? Mm. Yeah. Do you have any starch in here at all? No, we don't have any starch. That's why our fish balls is more exp on the higher, more expensive. Douglas says some fish balls sold in Singapore may contain starch, which makes them cheaper to produce. Besides fish, uh, what kind of other expenses come about with fish balls? The time yeah. that you have to put in. Okay. You need to be very early to prepare the fish. They have to fillet the fish, mince the meat, and then make it into the paste. After that, you have to form it. So the whole process is four hours. It's very labor intensive. Very labor intensive. One, two, three, four fish balls. Then this is my favorite, slippery and savory. <laughs> that goes into the water, shake that around a bit. Okay, mm. let us sit. Have a bath, I'll be with you in a second. Now, I understand why Douglas had to increase the price of his fishball noodles. That's right, that's how you do it. No need, no need to teach. <laughs> Making fish balls from scratch takes four hours a day. How's my tossing technique? Very Douglas? professional. <laughs> very good, very good. And because he insists on using high-quality pure fish meat, mm. he has to pay more for his raw ingredients. Hey, one more fish cake inside. Bro. One more fish cake inside. I don't want to miss that out. Hey, customer angry. Uh. Customer I angry. Hey, got hey, two fish, fish cake. cake. Okay. Yeah. Whole bunch of fish balls here. These are water. These are fresh. Two ninety-five. These are two sixty-five for almost four hundred fifty grams. Douglas's fish balls aren't the only fish balls that have increased in price. 130 grams, 200 grams per that weight. In supermarkets, fish balls are now over 30% more expensive than 10 years ago. Relatively short shelf life. The thing is, store bought fish balls are an entirely different store. Look at these ingredients. Ribonucleotides, surimi, and of course, starch. From the list, I can't tell how much fish there is in these fish balls. 
I hope Dr. Gan, a food scientist, will help me figure it out. So besides starch, I'm seeing other ingredients like disodium-5 and ribonucleotides. What are the functions of these strange-sounding ingredients? These are all different types of flavour enhancers just to improve the taste and flavour of the fish bowl. So these are just different types of seasoning then? Yes, they give you that umami, that savoury note that we are familiar with most meat products. How do these ingredients as a whole affect the cost of a fish bowl? Some of these ingredients say starch. They may actually affect the absorption of moisture or water in the fish paste. So if the fish paste with the starch combination is able to absorb more water, this means that your fish bowl actually has more water than fish. So that could bring down the price of the mm. fish bowl. Do you know what the rough proportion of fish meat inside fish balls is? In Singapore food regulation, there is a requirement for fish ball, fish paste or fish cake-like products to have at least 40% of fish. 40% fish sounds like an awfully small amount to me. Starches and other additives make it even cheaper. So why are these fish balls getting so expensive? I'm seeing all sorts of large equipment. What happens here? Okay, for the first step of our fish bowl production, it's actually the bowl cutting step, whereby the fish meat is chopped at very high speed. We blend it and we form it to a homogeneous fish paste. Dodo Fish Balls is one of the largest fish ball factories in Singapore. Two million fish balls are made here every single day. <laughs> I think I messed up the. It's okay. That's okay. Now, our fish balls have at least 50% fish meat. A big proportion is also water. Water? Yeah, water is essential to make sure that the fish ball uh, forms its um, gel strength, the bounciness, and the stringiness. At least 50% fish meat. That is more than the 40% minimum required by Singapore's food regulations. This is amazing. This is like a mochi almost. Don't just take my word for it. This machine does it scientifically. But it turns out, this process to satisfy our desire for the right springiness does contribute to increased prices, along with the rising cost of other inputs. We did increase our price of uh, fish ball uh, marginally for the past two years because raw material price has been increasing. The other part is uh, utilities costs. It has also increased more than 20% since five years ago. So, um, and with increasing uh, demand for higher quality products, um, uh, better food safety management systems, so these processes to be put in place requires costs incurred on our part, which is something that maybe consumers will not be able to see. In the past few years, we actually came up with a range of low-sodium fish ball that uh, is healthier choice for our consumers. Do these new products with lower sodium that are healthier cost more? Uh, yes, they actually cost slightly more because of the other ingredients that we need to um, get the same taste, similar taste at least, to the original fish ball. In your opinion, right, what is the biggest cost component of a fish ball? The biggest cost component is still the raw material, the fish. So we basically use yellowtail fish for our fresh fish ball because yellowtail fish is still the best raw material to get the traditional fish ball texture and taste that our Singapore consumers like. What kind of challenges do you face when you are sourcing yellowtail? Indonesia is the only source of raw material that we have right now. And yellowtail, from what I know, is a wild-caught fish. So far, there's no farmed yellowtail fish yet. So the price actually fluctuates based on catch and availability of the fish. Both Faye and Douglas insist that yellowtail is crucial to a good fish ball. But it seems that the erratic supply of yellowtail is causing this price increase. 
So I've gone back to fishball stories. Let's try, let's, let's try. try. I've a, not done it before. I want to convince Douglas to replace it with two other kinds of fish. Cheaper and easier to find. So this is the yellowtail fish ball. This is jackfish. And then this is dory fish. Shall we start with the yellowtail as our benchmark first? OK. You can taste the natural sweetness of the fish. No rubbery texture. Very springy, very light, very yep. cute. Mm. OK, mix. Wow. It's not as soft as the jackfish. It's like kind of artificial. Like silicone. And it's very watery. Wow. The bite. There's no bite. It's stick no the, well, it's sticking to the teeth. Eww. This is like a fish mash. It's a bit disgusting. Uh. Fishy weird smell. Wow, actually quite gross. <laughs> this is like a very fishy tofu that someone chewed up and then spat out. Uh, right. I, can use, I, I think you can use that to yeah. describe. Uh, I'm going to wash my head. <laughs> <laughs> can I borrow you for just five minutes? Douglas and I are not fans of the new fish balls. Tell me which fish ball you prefer. I wonder if we are biased and if a blind taste test would make a difference. So after trying all three, can you tell me which one you think has the best texture? Uh, the middle one. Definitely this. Ah, okay. It tastes more like a traditional fish ball. It feels more like a traditional fish ball as well. More chunky, mm. the springing and fresh with the meat. The bite is chewy and then bouncy. Real fish ball that we bite in. Yellowtail is a clear winner here. I started wanting to throw light on fish ball price hikes. But I've learned that our need for fish ball perfection is part of the reason. We need our fish ball to be light, springy, and bouncy. Yo! While also quite firm and smooth. Finally, the most important part, the taste. A good fish ball, right, needs to be sweet, needs to have delicate flavour and can't be too fishy. Mmm. That's really good. I've got a gentle snap. I've got flavour, I've got texture. It's not just homogenous, there are little bits I can chew. Very tasty. The magic to making the perfect fish ball lies in this fish. It's undeniable. Yellowtail's firm and light texture gives fish balls just the right amount of bounciness. Its mild flavour also gives fish balls their sweetness. Red Belly Yellowtail Fossilier which is the full scientific name of yellowtail. It's a saltwater fish that usually hangs out at the edge of the reef. Yellowtail fish are fast swimmers, active during daytime. Their food is zooplankton. And that can be found in abundance in Indonesia's beautiful Bangka Belitung Islands. These islands are Singapore's main supplier of yellowtail. And that's where I'm headed. 
the rising price of fish balls has been attributed to the erratic supply of yellowtail. And I want to get to the bottom of this. But my first stop in Belitung is much less picturesque. So these are large yellowtail, about 30, 40 centimetres long. And uh, easily six, seven hundred grams each. Lah. I'm at one of the largest yellowtail factories on the island. But unlike many factories I know, there aren't many machines here. It's because preparing this yellowtail requires a certain finesse that robots don't have. And I wonder if I do. Ready and go. Head on. She's already on her second fillet. I'm still dilly dallying on my first. Stripping the skin off. And she's. Ah, she's done. You can see she's getting a whole lot of meat out of the whole fillet, right? Whereas mine are sort of mangled and kind of looking. How long have you been doing this, but? I'm okay to settle for second position because. I got my ass handed to me by someone with 16 years of experience. How much do you sell the yellowtail fillet for, Ferry? Untuk musim sekarang ini harganya 33,000 sampai 32,000 biasanya. How much has the price increased in the last five or ten years? 50 percent. 50 percent. So that's half more expensive essentially from five years ago. Why is it more expensive now? Ikannya udah tangkapnya ke jauh. Nah, terus. Makanya hasilnya sedikit, ikan juga harganya jadi melambung tinggi. According to Ferry, local fishermen find it harder to catch yellowtail these days. So I want to find out why. Ini ditaruh. Nah, ini tarik lagi. Nah, ini yang aslinya, bubu. Sakit nggak tangannya? Oke lah. <laughs> I'm a chef, but today I'm ditching my day job to play fisherman. Okay, okay, fish on. I'm out in the Java Sea because I want to find out just why the price of fish balls have increased. <laughs> With me is Captain Mion. He has spent his entire life fishing. His preferred method of catching yellowtail are bubus also known as fish traps. He and his crew check the traps every three to five days. And we have one. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Let's not lose him. One yellow tail. Why is it so difficult to catch uh, yellowtail now? Karena udah banyak pak yang nangkap apa kapal-kapal yang lain gitu ya, dan juga masyarakatnya udah banyak. Jadi kadang-kadang bagi-bagi rezeki lah dikatakan dibilang kan. Kadang dulunya orang 20, kalau udah sekarang udah orang 50 yang ambil. Every year there's more competition and less catch. Fishermen like Captain Mion are competing with fishermen from other parts of Indonesia, like Java or Kalimantan. But they are not the only competition. By boats from outside, Captain Mion is referring to foreign boats who are illegally catching seafood in Indonesian waters. These boats don't have permits required to fish in Indonesia. 
For many years, Indonesian fishermen suffered great losses as their fish harvest dwindled. While foreign boats sold their ill-gotten catch from Indonesian waters below market price. Until... In 2014, Indonesia declared a war on illegal poachers. It deployed an ambitious fisheries enforcement program, which includes frequent sea patrols, seizing illegal fishing vessels, and banning the use of trawling nets. Behind us is the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing vessel that we caught. It's a big problem for Indonesia. It's all over the world. Illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing is distort the economy, especially on fisheries. And the biggest problem is they also depleted fish stock. Since 2014, Indonesia has seized some 10,000 illegal fishing vessels. These boats come from mainland China, Taiwan, Thailand, and the Philippines. This July, a new boat was seized near Batam Island. The Indonesian Navy had caught a fishing boat run by Russian crew called Nika. It's the biggest illegal vessel the Indonesian authorities have caught in years. Indonesian authorities accuse Nika's crew of falsely declaring the boat as a cargo vessel, even though it is evidently a fishing boat. An accusation the Russian captain denies. found guilty. This is what might happen to Nika. Because they're stealing fish, the justice is very fair. Now that the poachers are hunted and punished, fishermen like Captain Mion can command a better price for their catch. And this is another reason why we are seeing the price of yellowtail go up. With illegal poaching under control, the population of the yellowtail fish is bouncing back. Our sustained demand for the fish, in part to make our beloved fish balls, has kept prices high. Now that I know the effort that goes into catching the yellowtail, it's good to know that at least some of the extra money that we are paying for our fish balls would go towards making the lives of these fishermen better. Bangka Belitung Islands are not only famous because of their yellowtail exports. They're also one of the best places in Indonesia to catch squid. So I decided to try my luck. I've been here for two hours. And I still haven't caught anything. How long does it usually take to catch squid? Catch 
Brocky is right. You need a lot of luck to catch squid. These creatures love to move around a lot, and they cover a large area in the sea. Even sonars aren't accurate enough to pinpoint their location. Squid are also seasonal. In Indonesia, the high season is between July and September. And their numbers fluctuate greatly from year to year, possibly due to the El Nino weather cycle. So I'm looking for squid, right? And I found some fresh squid. It's about $5.40 for 340 gram um, pack of squid. Now this is about twice the price of what I paid 10 years ago. Hello, how much is this squid, huh? Um, 16 per kilo, is it? $17.90 per kilogram. In just 10 years, the price of squid has shot up 81%. It used to cost $9 per kilogram in 2009, but now its average retail price has jumped to $16. As a food lover, this pains me, considering squid are essential to many hawker dishes, like Hokkien Mee. I really want to find out what caused the price hike. Indonesia is the second largest source of squid imported to Singapore. This is Muara Angka, the biggest squid port in Jakarta. 90% of seafood brought in here is squid. Hello, Pa Amran. Hey, yeah. Nice to meet you. Uh, My name is Ming. Yeah. Captain Amran and his 10-man crew have just returned from a three-month fishing trip. How much squid in one trip? Kurang lebih tiga ton, empat ton aja, Pak. Their entire catch is frozen and kept under the deck when they're at sea for months at a time. It's basically a giant freezer down there. Hello! <laughs> okay, jangan lama lama. Dingin. It's warm outside, it's nice and cold in here, but I'm guessing I'm gonna try to regret this in a couple of minutes. I'm cold. My legs are starting to get tired. I'll do a couple more packs and then I'm out of here. I'm in a strange situation. I'm in the middle of the biggest squid port in Jakarta. In the bowels of a fishing boat. To be precise, a minus 20 degree freezer at the bottom of a fishing boat. All because I want to find out why the prices of squid have increased by 81%. For now, all I found out is that unloading three tons of frozen squid is not for the faint-hearted. I'm not enjoying myself. Uh, time for a tap out. Okay, ayo, like. Ayo. Awas, awas, legend. Oh, legend. Oh, okay. Same. <laughs> In the high season, Captain Amran and his crew can catch up to eight tons of squid. But the work is grueling. They work the entire night shining bright lamps to attract the squid. And they sleep in the day. This is a pancing. Okay. pancing cumi, yeah. With the squid hooks, all right, and the line. The primary method, yeah? All the facilities on this boat are very basic. 
inilah dapur kita kalau untuk masak segala macam kita makan kan tapi kalau udah pulang begini kan barang-barang peralatan dapur panci-panci segala macam udah kita simpan I would find it tough to cook here for three months, Ben. Where's the toilet? Kalau toilet hanya ini, Pak. Right here. Iya. Yeah. I can't imagine living and working like this. I'm very impressed by these men. It's tough work with unpredictable returns. For example, the ship's harvest this time round is only half of what they would usually catch. Once Captain Amran unloads his boat, the squid goes to another factory where it's sorted and packed for export. So, so yeah. we bring this over there? Yeah, yeah. Di sini kita uh, memisahkan jenis cumi dan ukurannya juga uh, kualitasnya, ya. Ini ya untuk ukurannya besar. Dari sini kita punya banyak size ya. Harry Chandra knows his squid. He's an heir to a seafood empire in Bangka Belitung Islands, Indonesia. How do you tell this is good quality squid? Dari warna di sini putih dan tidak ada merah ya. Kau untuk cumi yang kualitas terbaik. Yeah, you don't want to see too much red. Yeah. Needs to be nice and, and, and pale and white and clean all dan over. Dan matanya yang masih uh, clear ya. Ini masih yeah. sangat putih. Clear, clean eyes. Iya, yeah. dan tidak ada bau bau lain selain bau cumi. And no smell, yes. Yeah. When squid is in season, Harry receives up to three tons of fresh squid per day. Here, it's segregated, washed, and packed for export. Harry, this squid looks very nice. I mean, it's wide. It's a little bit pink also. It looks a bit plumper as well, right? Cumi yang kita biasa jual ke Singapura, ya. Ini permintaan Singapura. Kita cuci dengan air semua, dan kita bisa lihat di putih, untuk cumi-cumi yang sudah kena air, mereka akan membesar. This is soaked in water, and, and the quality? The quality akan sedikit menurun dari yang tadi, karena sudah terkena air. Ya. According to Harry, Singapore has a special request. To receive only clean squid. But squid swell up after being soaked and their quality suffers slightly. Why is it more expensive now? Kita sekarang sudah lebih maju ya, berkembang, belajar terus. Jadi kita cara perawatan cumi, cumi yang paling bagus dari penangkapan sampai sekarang. Jadi kita bilang ada harga, ada quality, ada quality, ada harga. Jadi untuk sekarang dan juga permintaan pasar uh, yang semakin banyak yang membutuhkan cumi. Nah, the harga pun makin bagus. Harry's father started this company over 20 years ago, exporting squid only to Singapore. But thanks to marketing efforts to promote Indonesian seafood overseas, Harry's family business has expanded to bigger and more lucrative markets such as Vietnam, Australia, and the fast-growing Chinese market. So Harry, we've got different types of squid here for different export markets, right? If you can sell higher priced squid to Australia or China or Vietnam, why do you still sell squid to Singapore? Kita sudah menjalin relasi kerjasama yang sangat baik dengan mereka. Jadi kita tidak untuk pedagang kita tidak boleh memutuskan satu hubungan relasi demi untuk harga yang lebih tinggi. One of Harry's biggest markets, China is a major seafood exporter itself. But with Chinese demand increasing and fisheries depleting, the Middle Kingdom is now also a major seafood importer from Indonesia. And according to Yugi Prayanto, Vice Chairman of Marine Affairs and Fisheries at the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, China now has the biggest buying power for squid. The seafood market now is controlled by the Chinese. So when you say controlled by Chinese, it means mm -hmm. the larger the market, the more they can set prices. Yes, agree. agree. So how does Singapore stand in all of this? Squid is uh, according to China demand. If the demand is high, so we are increasing the price. If Singapore doesn't want to buy, we are selling it to the China. So basically, we're paying a higher price for our squid because we're facing competition for it. 
making matters worse for sotong lovers in Singapore like me. The Indonesian appetite for squid is also growing, fueled by government efforts to encourage Indonesians to eat more local seafood. Baru masuk in. Nah. Just a few years, their seafood consumption has increased by a third. So I'm here at Sam Kapiting with uh, Pak Supri, the head chef of this popular seafood restaurant. How much do Indonesians love squid? Kalau di luar sana sini, favorit cumi, terus udang, yak piting juga. Bisa sehari itu bisa mencapai 50 orang untuk makan cumi. Seafood like squid is popular here also because it is cheaper than meat. Kalau untuk ini cumi asam pedas yang favoritnya di sini dan cumi telur asin untuk favorit. Salted egg yolk squid coated in a nice thick sauce. Oh yeah, it's good. My trip to Indonesia didn't just satisfy my appetite for sotong. It was an eye opener as well. Also coated in a nice thick red sauce. I have learned that the regional demand for squid is growing. And Singapore has to outbid bigger markets in order to get our fix of sotong. But it turns out there is another factor at play. Back in Singapore, I've realized that the price war isn't the only reason why I have to pay more for seafood. This is BC Chua. He works for one of the main seafood suppliers in Singapore. How have seafood prices in Singapore changed in the last couple of years? When Singapore was the hub for seafood, all the seafood comes into Singapore first before being exported out. So everybody gets cheaper prices for it because more seafood in, you can negotiate for cheaper prices. Now, because some of the seafood are being directly imported to other countries. The seafood range becomes smaller. Countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, they used to transport to Singapore, but now they can go direct to any other country. So Singapore used to enjoy discounted seafood thanks to its status as a well-developed transshipment hub. All seafood exports to the region and beyond had to pass through our ports to reach their eventual markets. But as other regional ports catch up, seafood exporters are now bypassing Singapore and shipping to their customers directly. This means Singapore no longer holds the bargaining power of a distributor. Instead, it has to compete directly with far bigger and more lucrative markets like China, Vietnam or Australia. We're finally paying the true price of what it takes to have regional fishermen ship their seafood to Singapore. But what if we can't rely on other countries anymore? Is there a way we can grow our own seafood, like squid, right here? So... Oh my goodness. You'll notice they are very picky, so they only pick on the slightly bigger one. The small ones, they just let go. They just let go, yeah. You can see. Some of them just let it go. They're quite picky on this. Yeah, these guys. Yeah. Currently, there are 125 fish farms in Singapore. I'm at one of them, Ahua Kelong. They have a pretty wide variety of seafood, from giant Queensland groupers to lobsters and clams. But these are not what I came here for. Do you have squid though? We don't farm squid here. One of the reasons will be, if you look at the sea cages, right, this is the size that we get. Why do you need the space? It's because these guys um, travel in long distances, apparently, in the wild. And then, uh, if you have like a very tight space, they won't survive, is that they'll keep knocking in and bouncing off and stuff like that. It'll cause them stress. Another huge problem is their food. Squid are picky eaters. And these little fish are only good enough for a grouper. So how is this different from feeding squid? The feeds need to be live. Young squid have to feed on living things. Eh? Mm -hmm. So typically, the, the, the small ones will have to feed on the living things. 
So for me to get a sustainable stock of uh, live produce to feed the squids, I, I'm not able to get it. And I can get it if it, I import it, but then it won't make sense uh, in terms of uh, value. So there won't be any squid farming in the foreseeable future. Through my journey, I've realised that for many years, we've been taking it for granted in Singapore. Having cheap, readily available seafood everywhere. Now that Singapore is no longer the seafood hub that it used to be, and farming certain types of seafood is just not a viable option, we're going to have to get used to paying higher prices.